most of that budget in 1950 went for public goods to a situation where most of the federal budget is, in the economist terms, now transfer payments, or entitlements being the popular term for most of those programs. In other words, the federal government moving money in order to address social issues from one segment of the population to another. Put differently, we have as a country for the last 60 years financed the very generous social welfare state we have created by reducing the role of the federal government in providing public goods specifically, including defense. We've been able to afford that as the economy grew and as military problems allowed us to spend a smaller fraction of our goods and services on national security. But that free ride, and I put that in quotes, that free ride is coming to an end. Hmm. We cannot maintain, as other commentators have today, emphasized the kind of defense establishment we currently enjoy with anything like the intra-World War I to World War II share of GDP that defense commanded that period. That was, for those in DOD who view the current budgets too austere, that was 0.9% of GDP. That is a really low defense budget. That's not where we're headed. So yes, maybe you could squeeze a little bit more. I was interested in, in uh, Michael Hallen's uh, uh, $100 billion number, which is very consistent, by the way, with what Senate 11, Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, has signaled that he would accept as defense cut $10 billion in the next year, which he mostly takes out of nuclear establishment, interestingly enough. Uh, uh, but that's a modest cut. That does not finance the social welfare agenda that we, uh, that we have. And indeed, this social welfare agenda uh, is a caution, I think, about the hope that we can count on our classical allies, meaning the Western European nations and Japan, for a significant contribution to the common defense in the next uh, several decades. Their social welfare burden and their demographic burden is much more substantial than our own. And I would uh, uh, align myself with a comment made this morning by several speakers about the importance uh, of demography in that, uh, in that uh, case. The fact that we're looking at slower growth, even with successful economic policies over the next uh, decade uh, or two, uh, exacerbates the resource problem uh, for defense. Most economists think we'll have slower growth for, for two reasons. First, the big shift in labor force participation of the last generation, which is the advent of women coming in the labor force and being able to succeed in professional positions, that has happened. We got a lot out of that as a nation, lifted our gross domestic product, it's over. Uh, now, it is true that the older generation, people like Mike Dunn and myself, are working longer uh, than anticipated. That helps a little <laughs> bit. But that doesn't really solve the problem. So it's slower growth. Dan's knees is a better example. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay. He's a better example of that outcome. Uh, and there's a lot of worry that uh, our ability uh, to uh, achieve the kind of productivity increases that we saw uh, over the last 50 years or so can be uh, sustained. And if there is one, another black swan I'd nominate, what if productivity growth goes to zero in the United States for a long period of time? We have come to accept the notion that it should be relatively easy with good public policy to achieve a sustained positive rate of productivity, meaning per capita income growth in the end, uh, in our society. That is an assumption that has been true for the West, granted for the last roughly 300 years years since the start of the Industrial Revolution. But if you look further back in history, if I may trot uh, more in Professor Scales, Alain, or the thousand years before that, productivity growth, uh, as best we can estimate it in the Western European nations, was zero. There was no growth in per capita income for, a thou roughly speaking, a thousand years. And that would create a very different society than the one we know now. Let me turn very briefly, if I'm right, from the macroeconomic picture to the microeconomic picture and the question of which economic factors might affect defense. And the one I nominate most of all is that if we're successful in achieving productivity growth, and that productivity growth, as it usually does, translates into increases in per capita incomes, meaning increases in wages and salaries, that presents an enduring problem for defense. As, uh, as Admiral Walsh properly said this morning, the largest part of the defense budget is not for the systems that are editorialized about our nation's newspapers, however much they may be part of the, assuming part of the debate. It is for operating costs. It is the cost of opening the door each morning. It's paying the people, military, civilian, uh, that operate the Department of Defense and give us defense capability. And in a market economy, 
defense has to compete with the private sector for those resources, meaning it has to match those wage gains. And yes, there is a slight echo out there. Mr. Mangell in the House raised the question of the draft, which lost. I think even he voted against it in the end. That's not a solution either. Most of the force, even a draft era, is, as others have observed, uh, composed of volunteers. Now, there is a sub-problem in a market economy, which is prices may vary a lot from one period to the next, and the part may get it wrong, as it has several times at various points uh, in recent history, whether that's foreign currency, whether it's fuel. That, there are ways to deal with that, but it does make the problem a little more difficult for the department. I do think the more Im uh, important issue over a longer time scale is this issue of demography. We're an aging, uh, we're an aging population. Our allies, ev our classical allies, even more so an aging uh, population. It means it's much harder uh, to raise a force composed mostly of young people. And at the same time, those societies, ours included, are properly attending to the needs of the older population, the whole issue of the entitlement burden, the social welfare uh, safety. And the Europeans, of course, have the added challenge of the Euro. Most economists, when the Euro was created, said this will not last. Now, they may have not waited long enough to cash in our short sale of Greek <coughs> bonds, uh, but uh, there are very serious signs of strain in the Eurozone, as we all know from reading the papers. And it's not clear that the Europeans preoccupied with the difficulties of their social welfare structure and the Eurozone problem will have much attention to devote to national security efforts and the kind of, uh, the kind of effort that Secretary Gates in his valedic valedictory uh, uh, visit to NATO urged them to uh, uh, assume. There is the, con the, the issue of the opposite to causality, and that is can defense affect the economy and particularly can it affect it in a positive way or could it affect it in a negative way? And certainly President Eisenhower spoke to this with his uh, closing uh, remarks to the nation, the warning about the military uh, industrial complex. That was an issue in the Reagan administration with the Reagan buildup, uh, bankrupt the United States in some fashion or be unaffordable as it was uh, put. I think the short answer to that question is, as it broad measure, defense is too small to make much of a difference. At 4 to 5 percent of GDP, with most of it going to operating costs, it's very hard to have a significant effect on markets. And that's, at the essence, the criticism of the current Secretary of the Navy's efforts to use the Navy budget to promote green fuel technologies. Yes, it's well-intentioned, but the Navy, in the end, is not that big a uh, market. Let me, if I might, offer you a bottom line. Uh, and that's the bottom line I think others today have identified. Uh, absent an actual war, the defense budget is likely to be constrained by the overall federal budget situation. There will not be the national will to raise taxes even further in order to finance a larger defense uh, structure. And certainly there's not much room for maneuver in the federal budget uh, given all the other pressures uh, on it. In that environment, I do think, and this is my one prescriptive plea, it's, it's very uh, consistent with what uh, Mike Dunn uh, said uh, this uh, uh, morning uh, and with uh, uh, Don Cawley's, or Cawley's point about the different value propositions. In that environment, I think it's very uh, important for the federal government as a whole and defense specifically to change its mental outlook on the problem. In the government, the, the lament is I'm being asked to do more with less. In other words, this is, a, this is an unfair burden placed on me it's not really possible to do this, but nonetheless, I'll more or less, call. I'll pretend to do it and <laughs> hope my political masters get off my back. That's the opposite of the private sector, where the whole ethos is, can I improve productivity? In other words, I need to do more with less because that's the only way I improve the bottom line and I can pay everybody somewhat more the next, uh, next period. That has significant implications for how the Defense Department manages both its personnel resources and its personnel rules as well as how it manages research development. Let me just offer a couple mundane, uh, but I would argue important examples. Uh, in the 1970s, the Air Force ran two different uh, maintenance approaches to the training of pilots at Reese Advanced Air Force bases, which some people here in Texas will actually remember the names of our. One was run entirely by contractors, one was run by military personnel. They both produced pilots with the same excellence, the maintenance was just as good at both places. There was a very significant difference in how they were staffed. The military operation had many more people paid a lot less. The private sector operation had a much smaller number of people paid a lot more. In other words, the private sector enterprise saw a large payoff to experience and stability of uh, the workforce. Very different example. For the volunteer force, 
We've decided it really isn't cost effective to have GIs peeling, peeling potatoes, and so we use civilian hires, contractors, if you will, to uh, manage dining halls and provide those services. That leads to when you deploy a force, the military takes the contractors with them. Big hullabaloo in the last decade about contracts to the battlefield. My answer is, of course we have contracts to the battlefield. You wouldn't want to take expensive military personnel and have them perform more mundane support chores, even if it pr produces certain management uh, problems. So we need to both stay the course where the department has made thoughtful substitutions and think about other substitutions that are possible. And likewise, on the research and development side, and, and Jonas Anini made a point about this uh, uh, this morning, but how we think about uh, getting, using vision development money to develop the kinds of articles we need for the future we immediately confront. And I would argue actually there are two parts to the R&D problem, and this would be a more positive vantage point on the distant future. In the next 10 years, we need to look hard at how we cut the operating costs. At the same time, if you look at the cyclicality, which others have pointed to in U.S. defense spending, almost like clockwork, every 20 years, now for totally different reasons, 1940, 1960, remember the 1960 election, the missile gap, and the Kennedy defense buildup, which built many of the Navy ships we had for the next uh, 40 years, including the Enterprise, which we just have now uh, retire, about to retire. Uh, 1980, uh, uh, 2000, the United States has made a political decision. It will, whatever the other costs might be, it will spend more on uh, defense. And so if you keep that calendar in mind, not saying there's any real causality behind this, this particular interim for the uh, uh, cycle, in the 2020s, it will turn again. And I think the challenge to the R&D community of this decade is not only to work on getting the operating costs down now because they must be reduced, but to think about what are the next big ideas that take years to develop, that we're ready to pursue, that will answer the military problems of the 2020s, which are, of course are very difficult now, if not impossible to see. But what are those next big ideas and how we develop so they're ready when that administration comes to office? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I guess it's fitting that we end yeah. the formal part of the conference and we are gonna conclude with a very nice reception and drinks after we finish this panel. But it's gonna be great to proceed now to the budget process, looking specifically at how the budget works. Did we lose the, mic uh, the PowerPoint? Yes, I need the data set, please. Okay, yeah, I need to get this back up. It may, the computer may have just gone. I can't gone. do this without figures. <laughs> I love figures. <laughs> They're not PowerPoints, I swear to God, General Scales. <laughs> there we They're go. They're figures. Okay, so we're going to get the numbers up. I know Dennis is very numbers driven, and we are going to see the numbers here. Yeah. Hippolito? Yeah. Got it. Okay, there you are, Dennis. Now. <laughs> it just makes my heart beat. <laughs> I'm going to uh, talk about something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the politics of the defense budget wow. with respect to defense and other components of budget policy, other types of spending, uh, revenues, and deficits and debt. And I thought it might be helpful to discuss the connection between defense and budget policy by focusing on fiscal consolidation, the need to reduce deficits and to stabilize publicly held debt at sustainable levels between now and the early 2020s, how this relates to defense. And yesterday, uh, President Obama said that this is a problem of arithmetic, not calculus, <laughs> which is reassuring as long as people can add and subtract <laughs> and that they're using the same numbers. And unfortunately, <laughs> facts are elusive for reasons that escape me. So I'll try to deal with some numbers that actually have meaning. Uh, a couple of preliminary points. The deficit and debt challenge over the next decade primarily involves taxes and discretionary spending, which is defense and non-social welfare domestic programs, along with some international programs. It doesn't really involve entitlements. You need to address the entitlement problem at some point, but the big bump in entitlement spending GDP levels, which is what everybody focuses on, doesn't begin until the 2020s. 
So for practical and political reasons, short-term fiscal consolidation will have to be dealt with first. And we start with this, and this is great. If you remember when President Reagan was selling his tax cuts, he said, there's a good line, there's a bad line. <laughs> He'd like to simplify it. That's what you've got here. <laughs> These are the parameters for that fiscal consolidation. They're fairly straightforward. What you got here are historical and then projected deficit and debt levels over an extended period of time. And from the early 1970s until 2009, deficits were chronic. You had four balanced budgets over this entire period, but the average deficit was less than 3% of GDP. And as a result of that, when you look at the debt, publicly held debt GDP never exceeded 50%, except for the early and mid-1990s, was usually well below 40%. The fiscal year 2012, by contrast, is publicly held debt well over 70% of GDP. You're starting to enter territory which is unusual in terms of our recent history. And looking ahead, the historical deficit average, if you look at what policymakers are discussing, that's the current benchmark. The agreement is that we need to keep deficit GDP levels below 3% in order to stabilize debt and, if possible, at some point to reduce that debt. But it's generally assumed that as long as you're where we're at now or slightly lower, that the fiscal risks are minimal. No one knows this with any precision. It's kind of a hope, but realistically, that's what you're looking at. And it's probably fair to say that balancing the budget in the foreseeable future in our lifetimes is probably not something we need to worry about a great deal because that's not where people are aiming for. They're aiming at controlling a problem, not really fixing it. And the good news is that current law moves budget policy into that safe area. Uh, and the answer to this, I'm sure most of you know. You got a number of temporary tax cuts, but especially the 2001-2003 Bush tax cuts that expire at the end of the year. You got the Budget Control Act of 2011, the legislation that emerged from that near debacle over the debt limit 14 months ago that contains defense and non-defense discretionary savings and some other mandated reductions of approximately $2 trillion over the next 10 years. That's the current base law scenario, everything that we've got in terms of current law. But what happens if policymakers block some or all of these deficit reduction measures from taking place? And that's what you see right there. This is the alternative scenario, what might be called the current policy scenario, since it reflects the policies that will likely be in place over this period. First that the Bush tax cuts are extended in large part, if not in whole. Second, something that no one is talking about, but which is an enormously important revenue number, which is the indexation of the alternative minimum tax. That's worth over $800 billion over 10 years. It is almost as much as involved with raising tax rates on you know, the wealthy, the near wealthy, the somewhat wealthy that we think they're wealthy or whatever the group <laughs> happens to be. So this is a given. AMT indexation is going to happen. Both parties support it. They do it every year. We've been doing it every year since 2001. But we never fix it because it's too costly in revenue terms. Third, and this seems like a small thing, but budget's made up of small things. Congress continues to block scheduled Medicare reimbursement rate reductions for physicians from taking effect. Uh, this is the so-called sustainable growth rate mechanism that was legislated in the late 1990s and which has been postponed every single year since 2003. And next year, if they decide to implement it, what it would mean is a cumulative cut of nearly 30% in reimbursement for, thank you, <laughs> in reimbursement for physicians. So this, is also each year postponed for an additional year, so you can expect this to occur as well. And then finally, and of special relevance to this conference, 
the roughly $1 trillion in automatic spending cuts or sequestration from the BCA will be canceled, and roughly half of that applies to defense. So the cumulative result of those changes and of the debt service increases associated with them is to move budget policy from a reasonably safe, which is your baseline, to a highly risky fiscal position. And much of that risk dynamic is tied to a word that no one wants to use anymore, but it's revenues. <laughs> and here again, you've got some historical perspective on tax policy. Over the past 40 years, well, until just a few years ago, revenues averaged about 18% of GDP. Only time they were appreciably higher, nearly 21% of GDP, which is essentially the World War II level, which Dr. Chu just alluded, was in the late 1990s, which was not, incidentally, the only time budgets have been balanced over the past four decades. And as you can see in 4B at the bottom, this bump was largely due to individual income tax increases. So whether these historical revenue levels or the elevated levels will be needed in the future obviously depends on what? What happens to spending? Yeah, outlays. Figure 4A, some suggestive historical evidence about spending from the early 1970s again to 2009. Spending averaged about 21% of GDP. The only time it dropped appreciably below these levels was in the late 1990s when post-Cold War defense cuts reduced defense GT GDP to about 3%, the lowest level since 1946, 1947. And you know, probably should mention at this point that despite lots of claims to the contrary, uh, domestic spending didn't decrease during the 1990s, didn't help balance the budget, as a matter of fact, total domestic spending to GDP increased during the 1990s. You can't trust Gingrich on anything. <laughs> and this needs at least to the next point, which is in 4B. The way we finance, and this is what Dr. Chu is talking about, the way we financed a good part of the social welfare expansion of the past several decades was through an offsetting decline in discretionary spending and specifically in defense. And the spending dilemma you now face is that what we call the welfare shift, which is what this phenomenon is, can no longer be extended because the margins are just not there. If you want the defense budgets that Republicans ostensibly support, and if you want the discretionary domestic programs to which Democrats are committed, which means something has to give. And some of the more publicized recent options are shown here, uh, courtesy of the Bipartisan Policy Center. There is such a group, believe it or not. Uh, it was founded several years ago by former Republican and Democratic Senate majority leaders who are no longer obviously in office. And <laughs> it sponsored the Domenici Rivlin Plan which, as you can see, is pretty close to Bowl Simpson in terms of its general outlines. And you also have, for purposes of comparison, President Obama's last budget program, the Ryan Alternative, and then what's called the Plausible Baseline. And the best way to think about the Plausible Baseline, it is essentially a Democratic version of spending and a Republican version of tax policy. And <laughs> which, by the way, is one of the realities that you're facing in the future. The Ryan plan, of course, projects much lower spending, two to three percentage points, than any of the competing plans, and its revenue levels are much lower as well. The obvious question, especially given last Tuesday, but quite honestly, ever since this Ryan plan surfaced, is it realistic to assume that spending can be cut that much? Is that plausible under any scenario? political scenario. And with the Obama administration, which is obviously going to be revised again given the election results, the spending and revenue differences are not as stark, but spending is still higher, revenues are still lower than Simpson Bowles, Domenici, Rivlin. Now, I might mention, you know, try to put this in some kind of context. These partisan differences are not really new. They are, in effect, 
a continuation of where the two parties have been for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And the impasse over spending and revenues has been in place really for the better part of about 50 years. We've been having a debate about whether to balance the budget or control deficits at high or low revenue levels. So in effect, remember the Moynihan thing about defining deviancy down? <laughs> now we define balancing the budget as a 3% deficit or less. And this has been going on ever since the social welfare expansion of the Great Society that was extended by Democratic Congresses during the 1970s. And that expansion broke the strategic, the bipartisan strategic consensus that had governed defense budgets and that it also insulated revenue levels to support those defense budgets. And the welfare shift is a big change in the way we did budget policy in partisan terms. The Reagan years are in effect an experiment in cutting revenues and then cutting domestic spending to match those lower revenues. In effect, reversing a good portion of the great society. And it failed because Congress, which had, by the way, Republican control of the Senate for six of Reagan's eight years, was unwilling to retrench entitlements anywhere near what the administration repeatedly requested. But the Reagan era did spawn a Republican orthodoxy about balancing the budget at low revenue levels that has dominated the party ever since. Now, the balanced budget of the late 1990s, as I mentioned earlier, these were democratic budgets. They had high revenues, high domestic spending levels, and the major source for that, which was the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993, was unanimously opposed by Republicans in the House and in the Senate. When George Bush took office, he reversed the 1993 tax increases, and that was his first priority. But when war effectively reversed the defense decline, deficits were not the unsurprising result of all of this. What moved us into